All right, at the risk of being a little bit less imposing, I'm going to sit down because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be typing a lot during this presentation. Can everybody see this fairly clearly? All right, great. Um, so I entitled this somewhat whimsically, uh, Julia to Lisp or not to Lisp. Um, you know, there's people have uh, thrown around claims that uh, Ruby is an adequate Lisp and JavaScript is really basically Lisp. Um, Julia was very much inspired by Lisp, uh, specifically Scheme, but uh, also also other form varieties of Lisp. Um, and there's a little Easter egg that I'll actually demo at the very end, but. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to do a point-to-point -point comparison because I think that's just not that interesting. So I'm just going to talk about a lot of the interesting features, and I think you guys will be able to see for yourselves where the similarities and differences are. Uh, and then we can discuss it at the end. Um, so I'm going to start out with an observation about numerical programming languages, which are this sort of funny, idiosyncratic lot of languages which... Uh, one of my co-founders put into this graphic here at some point, which is supposed to be roughly proportional to their popularity. R, MATLAB, those are the big ones. Mathematica, SciPy. Um, and, and so what's the deal with these? Like, what, what makes them numerical? Um, and the obvious answer is that they, they're specialized somehow for numerical work. Um, that also gives you a little bit of a clue why there's so many of them. But let's look at a couple of them first in a little more detail. So MATLAB, uh, the premise of MATLAB is actually brilliant and simple. Initially, it was just everything is a complex matrix. It's the simplest type system ever. There are no other types, just that, complex matrix. Um, of course, that's great until at some point you need to do something that doesn't involve complex matrices, which inevitably happens. But, you know, and then this type system spirals out of control because it wasn't designed to handle any of that. And they have like four object systems at this point. Um, R and S before it, this is an interesting language for data analysis and statistics. Um, one of the key design points is that there should be support for not available values everywhere throughout the language. Um, and because it's baked into the core of the language as this basic idea, all the libraries support it and everybody sort of jumps through hoops to make sure that they can handle the fact that every, every data value might be not there. Um, they also have this data frame as a basic data type, which is this very complex tabular data structure, but which all of the libraries work with. So again, you know, it's a little bit complex for a fundamental data structure, but because they make such good use of it, it's actually pretty powerful. Um, Mathematica, this is a weird one because it's not really numerical, it's really symbolic. Um, it's all symbolic writing. Um, it was inspired by Maxima, I think. Um, it's very lispy in a lot of ways. Um, so so the, the point about specialization for numerical work is that the reason I think there are so many of these in this graphic here is because there's so many different ways you could possibly specialize. So everybody has their own take on what they want to do with numbers and how, what they want to calculate, how they want to do things. And so you end up with 40, 50 different ways to possibly specialize on numerical computing. And that's why we have this sort of jungle. Um, so is scheme numerical? Would anybody, I mean, show of hands, who's going to say yes or no? I don't know. Yes. OK, so kind of, kind of, maybe. I don't know. I don't think it's especially numerical, but something weird is going on in the scheme spec. I don't know if you can see much of this. You don't really have to see very well what's going on. You see the, the green boxes here are the parts of the scheme spec, which is you know, notoriously terse and concise. Um, that's the stuff that's addressing numbers and arithmetic. Um, and actually, the, the big one on the left is only about a page. It's the arithmetic section over on the right that's the real killer, because that's nine pages. Every single other section in this entire spec is like a page max. And then for some reason, they have to spend nine pages on arithmetic. It's kind of weird. What's going on here? Why is this so much of the spec? Um, so all in all, it's about 20% numerical stuff. Um, C99 is similar. It's also 20%. It's a much bigger spec, of course, but it's also a very, very weirdly large portion of it is dev devoted to things like how does plus work? How does time, like, you know, these, these sorts of things. Um, so are we doing it wrong? Like, why do we have to spend, which isn't the whole premise of scheme that you have a couple of simple axioms and then you bootstrap yourself from there and then, you know, you don't have to specify, like, nine pages of rules for arithmetic? Like, that should just be code. Um, and so I, I, I'm, you know, you know, observe that numerical languages are strangely diverse. General languages are strangely numerical. Something, something funny is going on here. Um, 
So in Julia, we took a new approach, which was we basically, when we started designing the language, asked ourselves, what does it take to make numbers not special? What does it take to take out that nine pages of the scheme spec? Um, and so all, all numeric types are just going to be user-defined. Some of them will be defined for you because it would be inconvenient to start up a prompt and be like, well, I don't know what integers are. Um, but, but they are just going to be defined in Julia code, and how they behave is just going to be defined, defined in Julia code. Um, and all of that is just going to be user-level user code that's essentially just provided for you before you start up. Um, so now I am going to switch to some code. Um, all right. I'm actually going to close these because it's more impressive when they just open up by themselves. Okay, so this is the Julia prompt. Um, let me actually start it up again here. So you can see the pretty little banner, nice little ASCII. This is the first thing we ever had. We had this banner, and then we actually had a scheme prompt that parsed Julia code um, and produced ASTs as S expressions. And actually, you can still see that. It's still baked in. So if you do dash dash lisp, you get a uh, oops. It doesn't have any. <laughs> it doesn't have any line editing capability, so you can't make any mistakes. But you can see that if you do, you know, one two three, you get six. Um, um, but one doesn't usually do that. You start this, and then you know, instead of S expression syntax, you have this, you know, familiar infix syntax, and you can do things like, uh, you know. X equals 3.4, 2x uh, cubed minus 3x plus, plus 2 is, you know, 70.4, some trailing stuff. Um, this is the kind of notation that math people are going to feel familiar with. Um, you can also do things like write an anonymous function uh, and then apply it to a value besides that. And you can see here that this, this is the usual dynamic language duct typing, the same expression, the same function. If applied to an integer, does integer ops. And if applied to a, a floating point number, does floating point ops. Um, and actually, let's take a look at what happens when I do 1 plus 2. It seems like the most basic thing. So we have this edit macro. Um, and macros are, in, macros are invoked with an at sign. Um, and this is, this is definitely a point of philosophical departure from, from Lisp, where you can't really syntactically tell the difference between macros and functions. We felt that it was a good idea to just, you know, announce to the world when you invoke a macro something weird is going on here. Um, we can talk about that later. We'll probably get get to that in the discussion. But that's that's how you invoke them. So the edit macro takes uh, looks at an expression. Um, if it's a function call, it looks at the method that is called and opens it up for you in your editor, which you configure via an uh, environment variable. So here, when I say edit 1 plus 2, it takes me to the definition of the, of the plus method for integers. Um, and you can start to see a little bit of funny stuff here. That's OK. Something's going on here. Um, so I can spell this out a little bit for you. So up here, we have type alias bit integer um, is a union of all of the bit integer types, which are defined up here to be uh, various other ones. It's basically unsigned int and you know, unsigned int, and then you know, eight bit, sixteen bit, thirty two bit. Okay, so what's up with those? Where do those come from? So I'll open. There's a boot file, and as promised, this is where all the all the types, the basic types, are defined in Julia code. Um, and what happens here is you declare an abstract number type. This is at the top of the numerical hierarchy. And then under it, you declare a real type, and then abstract float, which is a subtype of real, integer, signed, unsigned, so on. Um, so you get a nice little tree. Uh, and then you start declaring some actual concrete types. And you have to start, usually if you're doing user-defined types, you just declare composite types with fields, but you have to start somewhere, right? Where, where do you start this process? And so we have this bits type primitive, which basically just says, look, this thing is just a chunk of data. It's just however many bits. Here's the name, here's the thing it's a subtype of, and that's all you need to know about it for now. At this point, this thing doesn't know how to print itself, it doesn't know how to do any operations, it doesn't know anything about anything. But then we give it all these methods, which is what you see in this int, 
int file, and that actually just sort of layers on methods and teaches it how to do things. Um, and so this is the line that teaches the system how to add ints that are of the same type. Um, and what you can see is you see these calls to sort of funny name things, add int, unbox, and box. Um, those aren't actually available uh, in a typical session. Add int is not defined. But what they are is they're actually intrinsics, which you can get at. Uh, so intrinsics, add int, and you can see that add int is the third intrinsic. Um, uh, box is the zeroth intrinsic, and unbox is the first intrinsic. Um, and th those are just, they're not real functions, they just are sort of these pseudo functions that the, that the system uses to bootstrap itself that know how to generate code. Um, we can actually look at the code for the, uh, for defining these. It's a file called, imaginatively enough, intrinsics, CPP. Um, there's a small amount of C and C++ code, probably about like total you know, 20, 30,000 lines of C++ code. Um, and we can find the add int intrinsic. And you can see that it's actually just implemented as a case statement where you're going through and sort of emitting LLVM code for various things. And this one is incredibly easy to emit. You just have this LLVM builder and you call the create add instruction. So all this does is create in, in, emit a single integer add instruction. Um, and we can see that. So. So essentially what's going on here is you call this, this method, which calls these intrinsics, and the intrinsics tell the system, okay, well, if you want to add two integers, you emit this instruction, um, and that's just how you do it. And you can, we can actually see that in, in action and see the LLVM code for one plus two, uh, and it's just this one add instruction. So it's not very exciting. Um, and that, that is another macro which does sort of the same sort of thing. Instead of editing the thing you're looking at, it dumps the code for it. Yes, and they behave as the machine does, um, which is another departure from Lisp. And this is one of those things that uh, I, I wish it were cheaper to check overflow and throw an error. I wish it were cheaper to have uh, big ints, but I don't know, for numerical computing, we really need this stuff to be blazingly fast. We do have big ints, of course, but you have to opt into those. Uh, and you can see the native code for that which is, for some reason, weirdly long. There's some sort of preamble and postamble going on here. I don't, I don't know why that, that native code is very weirdly long, but it shouldn't really be that way. There's a call going on for some reason. Hmm. Um, but anyway, we can see if you, if you define something that's a little bit longer, like uh, 2x plus 1, uh, and you can see the LLVM code. It's pretty straightforward. You know, shift left and then or because that's sort of the fancy way to do it. Uh, and you can see that it's a very small number of actual native instructions. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then if we if we apply the same function to you know 3.5, we get a floating point number 3.6. Um, we get we can look at the LLVM code for that, and it's going to be slightly different, right? You got the int version, and you got the, the floating point version. Here you actually have to do the multiply and add. You can't do the integer tricks. Um, and you can see the native code for that. Oh, whoops, that's the one I already showed you. OK, so it's a little more complicated. Um, so let's just write a complete Julia function just for the sake of entertainment um, and seeing a little bit of real code. This, is, this sort of bootstrapping code is a little bit weird, but it's actually not that uncommon to see a lot of very short one-line definitions. So this syntax for defining a function is basically the function call with arguments which have uh, a type annotation. And so that's, we'll get into dispatch later. Um, but if you only call a method if the, if the types apply to the actual arguments. And then the right-hand side of the equals is the, is the thing that is the expression that you evaluate to assign it. There's also a longer form, which I'm going to put here. So I'm going to write a function that computes the next Fibonacci number after something. Uh, 0 n, 1 of n, uh, and then while n less than b, a comma b equals a plus b, and then 
well, actually, so I want A to become B, and then B to become A plus B. That's how you compute those. Okay. So this is a function that computes the next Fibonacci number after something, some number. Did I do something wrong here? A equals B zero, one. Oh, um, well, B less than N, yes, I inverted that. Okay. Yeah, okay, so now we're, now we're cooking with gas. All right. Um, and you can see, we can see the, uh, the integer overflow going on here. So, you know, that is fine. Um, and we can see, again, the, you know, the native code for this is very short. It's nice, nice integer ops. This is, this is where you want the performance, because you want this to be that, that short. Um, but, of course, you know, if we, if we crank this up to, to the 63 minus 1, oops, it hangs, because now there's an infinite loop in there. We're never going to actually get fast that, because we're actually going to overflow. Um, Mm, there we go. I think someone broke the control C handling recently. I'm running on like a fresh master version, which is super risky, but you know, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, but what I can do is I can pull out this int 128 type, and then it works fine. Um, and, you know, we see, okay, code native for that. It's going to be a couple pages of code, but it's still very, it's still very efficient, which is nice. Um, of course, you know, at some point you get up to, you know, 127 minus 1, and this is also going to overflow. Oh, no, wait. Why doesn't that overflow? Or why, does that, why doesn't that hang? Hmm. I don't know. Does anybody have any, any clue? No? I don't know. Anyway, but we can get the correct answer by switching to big ints. It is fast. <laughs> oh, for some, you know, yeah, for some reason. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm being an idiot. Um, I need to apply the int 128 to the 2 because otherwise we've already overflowed by the time I'm subtracting the 1. Okay, so there's the, one, there's the 2 to the 127 minus 1. Uh, now if we do the next fib. Okay, now it hangs. I'm playing with fire here. And... Okay, but we can, you know, bring out the big guns, so to speak, and we, with big int, it works. Okay, so, you know, yes, it would be nice if you just didn't have to worry about this, but if you want to trade off performance, at least you can write generic code that's going to work for different types, and it's fairly easy to, to do that. Um, okay, so back to the pre presentation. I'm going to be switching a little bit between slides and demo here. Um, oh, yeah, we already saw that. Okay, so here's the challenge. Like, what does it take to make numbers just another type and still be able to do numer real numerical work? One of the things we just saw is that basic things like, you know, integer and floating point arithmetic have to be really fast. Um, that's, that's sort of fundamental. Um, another interesting thing is that numeric operations, stuff like, you know, your humble plus and times and array indexing, <laughs> Uh, and then there's this backslash, which is, does any, is anybody familiar with backslash from MATLAB? Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it solves a linear system, and it is, has been said that there is more research behind this single character than anything else in all, like, anywhere, right? Like, this is the single, the most packed character of all time, because this, you know, has, it's a crazy poly algorithm that can solve all sorts of problems, under-constrained, over-constrained, you know, you can do all sorts of stuff with matrices and vectors, and it's just all in this, like, one backslash character. Um, well, these are weirdly polymorphic. Um, in fact, you know, you, you can kind of tell because in most programming, that's, that's the nine pages of the scheme spec is, like, what these things are supposed to do. It's also the 20% of the C spec that is numerical, is, like, you know, spelling out what happens when you add an integer to a float and, you know, complex numbers and, and yada, yada, yada. Um, and you, you definitely cannot define a C function that does the things that the plus operator does. 
Um, and that's actually an, a common theme, is that these operators are somehow special um, and couldn't actually be defined in the language. Um, the behavior in particular depends on all the arguments, not just the first. Sometimes that's static, sometimes it's dynamic. In a dynamic language, you really want it to be dynamic. Um, if you want to be able to extend these operations to new types, new user-defined types, and in our case, we're constraining ourselves to definitely do this because even the built-in types are user-defined. So this is tantamount to solving the expression problem. So, okay, well, there's ways to do that, but you know, keep that in mind. Um, to me, this sort of just screams one thing, right? This is, there's, there's one seems to me obvious way to address all of this, which is we need multiple dispatch. Um, and so that's, that was one of the first design choices in the language, was to make it a multiple dispatch system. Um, but if ops like you know, int, int, and float times float are gonna be generic, and they are, um, they better be blazingly fast, basically free, actually. You want them almost always to not actually have any abstraction cost, and we're gonna see a little bit how that, how that works. Um, so the next example. Uh, okay, so let's actually see a little bit of basic multiple dispatch first. So, you know, f of a comma b equals fallback. Okay, so f one comma one comma two equals fallback. All right. Well, let's say I decided I wanted, uh, you know, if a is an int and b is an int. Uh, I actually want to say both integers. Okay, so now it says both integers, but if, you know, B is a string, then you get fallback. Um, so, and you can do some other things, like A is an int, B is a number. Uh, and okay, so we can actually see the methods of f, um, and so this is we can see all these different things. We can actually, you know, see um, can we actually get the fallback if the other thing isn't a number. Basically, what's going on here, you can think about it as just if you're trying to apply a method. You've got some arguments, you look up the function, you scan this list of methods, they're sorted in topological order of specificity, and you call the first thing that matches. So the first thing you could call, you call. What happens if you do the whole function and then it just closes? So, so in that case, you call the first one because it applies. Oh, if you had ambiguity. Okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's try that. So. Uh, so you used to do that, but we just changed this. So now, if you do that, oh, whoops, yes. We should get an error. So we found, we, initially we thought it was better to warn as soon as you had an ambiguity. Um, and, and that, so that's what it used to do, be until like two days ago. Um, this is, you know, bleeding edge master. Um, except at some point I refrain from pulling and building because then all my examples might break. You know, you don't want to take that risk. Um, so the, the problem was we found that unrelated packages were sh that are both extending the same generic function um, would j inevitably cause warnings. Um, so it turns out it's better to just throw an, a, an error at runtime when you, ha when you actually call an ambiguous method, um, which wasn't obvious a, a priori, but it turned out with, you know, as the ecosystem grows, it was just intractable to, to deal with all these warnings. Um, so that's a thing we recently changed. I'm actually very excited about this change. Um, previously, it meant that you would load one package and that would be fine, and then you'd load another unrelated package and suddenly you'd get, you know, warnings spewing in your face and it feels very, feels very, you know, brittle. Uh, it didn't actually cause any problems because it was only a problem if you called one of these, you know, <coughs> nonsensical combinations of things, which you don't actually do, but, you know, now it's only an error if you actually do it, which just seems better. Um, okay. 
Uh, all right, so we covered a little bit of basic multiple dispatch. Um, you can do interesting things in Julia, like you can do, say, t is a number. So this is a static type parameter. And you can say a is t and b is t. Uh, okay, and then you can say g, uh, well, that's going to be still ambiguous, but you can do 2.5 and 3.5, and you say both of type float 64. Let me pull that up so people can see it. Um, and so the constraint here is that it only applies if, if the two arguments are actually of the same concrete type. And this turns out to be very useful when bootstrapping things. There's a lot of times when you want something to apply, but only if, you know, if things are the same type. And we saw that in the int definition. It's this, this add method. This intrinsic definition only applies if the two things are actually of the same concrete type. Otherwise, we actually don't know how to do it, and there's some, some other method will have to catch it. So, okay, what is that other method? Um, what happens when we do something with mixed? Um, okay, so 1 plus 2.5 unsurprisingly works, but what is going on here? And I'm actually going to, so I'm going to do, I'm going to use a, another brand new thing. So this is weird, like, Common Lisp has everything and has had everything forever. Um, we, like, just got a really good debugger, as in, like, a month ago. Um, and it's still got rough edges, but it's pretty nice. Um, it generates a lot of code, so this is going to take a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to enter the debugger for this expression 1.25, um, and it's generating more code, which is why it hangs for a second. And it shows us that this is the this is the method that gets called here. So we don't have any specific definition in place for one plus two point five. So an int and a float sixty four, we don't really know how to do it. But what we do know how to do is that if you have two things that are numbers and you try to add them, we call this promote function on the two arguments, and then the dot 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 means splat those arguments in as separate argument. The flat, splat the tuple that comes out as separate arguments, and then call plus again. Um, and we can actually see that in action. If we call promote 1 and 2.5, uh, that J was just me typing, um, you see you get a tuple that is 1.0 and 2.5. And 2 so it promotes them to a common type, which in this case is float 64. But how does that work? Um, the way it works is that there is a promote rule function, which is you, you basically write these promote rules. Um, And you can see that there's a lot of methods to promote rule. It has a huge amount of rules, and essentially what it is is it's a it's a multiple it's a it's a multi method um, that just has takes types as the arguments and tells you and the, as a rule it tells you what the what the result is. And so in this case we can see that promote rule um, int and float sixty four. We're going to see what it does. Okay, well one of them says union. So this is the thing. We make it symmetric, so one of these is going to usually be the empty type, which is bottom, and the other one is going to tell you the correct answer. And then we actually union those, and that's, that tells you what you actually want. Um, so there's a promote rule for float64 and int, which says that float64 wins. And we can actually see that. Um, that's where it's defined. It's kind of nasty to see because... Um, it's in a loop and some evals, but you know we want to define it for a whole bunch of types. So this this defines it for eight different types all at the same time with you know the same bit of code. Um, nothing crazy if you're used to that sort of thing. Um, okay, so let's see where we are. So let's step into this definition. Um, so this is what this is what promote is defined as. Promote takes the two types as arguments. Um, or two values of two types, and then calls the, on those types, it calls the promote type function on, on, the one, on the one pair, calls it again, converts each of them to that promotion type. All right. 
So let's step in a little further. So the promote type function computes this promote rule, calls promote rule both to both different directions, and then promote result basically does some shenanigans to figure out what the what the correct end result is. Um, you can kind of see that we're going through all of this, and here we are at that line where the promote rule is defined. Uh, and then, okay, we get through some stuff, and the return result is float 64. And then we actually go through and compute it again, because in, in principle, we're computing this twice. Um, yada, yada, yada. We call it again. Okay, so we converted 1 to 1.0, 1 to 1 we converted 2.5 to float 64, which is a no-op. We return 2.5, then we get this tuple, 1.0 and 2.5. Uh, we return the tuple, then we apply the plus function to it, and we actually do the addition, finally, and then we return 3.5 from the function. So that is a lot of work to get 1 plus 2.5. And in principle, that is what's happening. And what our debugger does is it actually interprets all of that stuff and goes through so you can see what's happening. But the actual code for this is, of course, not that. It is just these two LLVM instructions. So the way this works is that between inlining and type inference, the compiler is able to figure out that all of that stuff amounts to nothing. It's just a whole lot of noise to just do this. But, in, but, that, but this is the only way we specify how to do those mixed type operations. And you can do fairly complicated ones. So you can do things like, uh, let's see, um, let's do a complex integer. So that's a complex integer. You can see that the type of that is complex, uh, and then the type parameter is in 64. So 1 plus 2m. Um, and then let's do something like add that to a rational, so two-thirds, and it figures out that the, the type you want is a complex rational int, and that goes through a whole variety. Of, there's like sort of very, these very generic uh, promote rules for that, um, which we can look at some of them. Um, Okay, so let's see the promote rules here. Um, whoops. Okay, so here's here's some of the promote rules. Uh, okay, so if you have a rational with type parameter t, which is some type integer type, and you have an integer type s, then that should promote to a rational whose type parameter is the promotion of the two type, the integer types T and S. Makes sense. Um, the powerful thing here is that it's generic and it's parameterized over all possible integer types. So we know how to handle it for any, any kind of integer type. We don't have to specify it. Um, if you have two rationals and, you know, they have with their two integer types, then you just promote the two integer types and then make a rational of that type. Um, so we can see things like this, you know. So let's see, we have... Uh, you know, int 8, 1, 2, over int 8, 3, plus uh, u int 16, 3, over u int 4. Um, you're going to see that that is a rational of u int 64. I'd actually like to change that promotion, if we do unsigned and signed, we, the unsigned sort of thing, thing wins, but I kind of think it should just be an int 64. Uh, you can see that if, uh, if neither of these is unsigned. Oh, and unsigned numbers are printed in hex with the correct number of bits, because when you're dealing with unsigned numbers, usually you care about bit patterns. That's usually what you use them for. If you care about values, you use signed integers. Um, you can see that works out to seven twelfths. Uh, okay. Anyway, that's a, that's an int sixteen rational because they the, the promotion of this. Oh, type of type of ants. Uh, it's data type. Yeah. So this is the root. This is the type of types. Um, uh, it is the same. Yeah. 
Uh, we're, we're not afraid of a thing being its own type. It's not, you know, it's not ML. Um, Okay, so anyway, I should probably move on from this. So, so the, initially, we actually had keywords and, and built-in mechanisms for doing promotion, and then at some point, we realized that we could do it all with multiple dispatch, which was actually kind of an amazing realization, and that has worked out remarkably well. Um, you can add a new numeric type and have it hook into this system, and it just works. It's, it's, it's kind of magical. It's very cool. Um, And, and, and we accomplished what we set out to do, which was not to have to bake these things in and, and specify the rules in the spec. Okay. All right, so another requirement for doing new real numerical computing is you need arrays and you need them to be efficient. Um, in particular, you know, so if you have some sort of heterogeneous array like this, um, you know, the only sane way to represent it is you have you know, a, a type tag, and then you have a bunch of pointers to individually box elements. That's just sort of what you're forced to do. Um, you know, and if you have a, a heterogeneously typed array that happens to just contain floating point numbers, um, well, now this is incredibly wasteful. What you would actually like to do is to store them in line. Um, uh, so that's, you know, one of the immediate things is like, okay, well, we need multiple dispatch and we need parametric types because we would like for our array type to just support this out of the box. Um, this is such a basic use case for numerical computing that we, you know, we can't just bolt it on. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, you know, so uh, let's, let's see. If you do, you know, one, two, three, uh, you see that it is an array of int 64. We print it as a column because it turns out that when you have a vector, it's, it's basically identified as a column vector. And if you print it horizontally, everybody gets terribly confused. If you print it vertically, then nobody complains. So we print, we print our vectors vertically. It's a, it's a weird hack. That solves the problem. Before that, everyone was incredibly confused. Um, if you stick a floating point number in here, you get a whole floating point array. This uses the same exact promotion system to figure out what the, what the type of something is. But if you th stick something in there that, that can't really you know, be, be uh, unified with the, with the, through promotion, you end up getting an any array, which is going to be that you know, array of pointers to individually heap allocated elements. But if you, do, um, if you do that, you can actually get a pointer to this. Uh, you know, we don't encourage this sort of thing, but in, t in order to interact with C, you do actually need to be able to do stuff with pointers sometimes. Um, and then you can actually you can actually load that pointer. It's unsafe load, and you see you get the first element. If you you know you can get the third element, then of course if you go past that, you know who knows what you're getting. Now you're really playing with fire. Um, Zeroth element is some random stuff. That's the type tag. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, basically, it is attempting to do alignment, and numbers are aligned on the right or at the floating point, and strings are aligned on the on the left. Um, you can see this 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 works. You know. So if you wanted this to be in any array, you could do that. Um, if you wanted it to be, for example, a complex uh, float64 array, you can do that. And then it tries to align on the plus. Um, it's very, it's, it's a, it, this needs a, an overhaul. You can, it kind of works. Um, you can see that you can, you can fool it and get it to do weird alignment stuff fairly easily. But it's you know, better than nothing. Um, <clears throat> Okay, anyway, so th this, is, this is the deal with arrays. Um, a an important part of this is uh, we can define immutable types. So immutable types was a feature we added very, very early on because, for example, uh, if you look at this rational type, it's a new, you know, it's a in type, it's the type declaration is immutable and then it's rational and it has this integer type parameter and it's a subtype of real. It has two fields, num, which is of type T, which is the, whatever the rash integer type is, and denominator, which is also of type T. Then we give it a constructor, which, you know, you check that it's not zero over zero, and then you put it into lowest terms, and you return a new object. 
Um, this is called an inner constructor. Inside the inner constructor, the main thing is just that this new pseudo function is available to actually make an object. You can then add other constructors on the outside that call that inner constructor. Um, <clears throat> and they just sort of do, pr like, for example, convenience things like promoting if the, if the arguments are of different types. Can you add one of the You can, yeah. It's, it supports infinities because it, was, it sort of fell out that it was pretty easy to do. Uh, NAN was impossible. It was a total nightmare. It made all of the operations awful. So, but infinities were actually fine. Um, <clears throat> so it's important for these to be mutable. Um, so let's say you know Q is two over three. We can see that Q is the, not, the numerator of Q. We can also see stuff like you know uh, four over sixteen. Uh, it goes into reduced terms. So the numerator is 1, the denominator is 4. Um, if we try to set the denominator to something else, it says the type rational is immutable. Um, it's really important for it to be immutable because that allows all sorts of compiler optimizations. Uh, it's even more important for it to be immutable because it's crazy to have numbers be mutable. Um, there was, I think, the easiest way to to like understand that is that there was an early, the bug in an early Fortran compiler that, that well, well they, they just implemented numbers by having them sort of be like names for things that were allocated on the heap. So you could assign to two and change it to three and then anytime anyone used two, it would be three, which, you know, like nothing will ever work again, right? This, you, can, you can also do things like you can redefine the integer addition in here, and it will crash Julia almost immediately. We should probably have a facility for sealing it, but we don't yet. Um, huh? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, right. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's very similar to that. That was, that was exactly what was going on in Fortran. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead a little. I have a little another example where I load a picture of a puppy, um, and look at it. But I think I'm gonna move on. Everybody loves puppies, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me talk about staged programming. Uh, so staged programming is just you know anything that allows the programmer to generate code at various points in the compilation process. Um, so it's helpful to look at the actual pipeline that we use to generate code, which is totally standard. This is not anything fancy. Um, you know, source text, do lex, tokens, parse, AST. Um, inlining and type inference. This is sort of where all the magic at the Julia level happens. Um, the, the lowering is just to make things easier to work with, right? Um, and lexing and parsing are completely normal. Lexing and parsing is done in scheme. That's what that, you know, Julia dash dash lisp is for. Um, <clears throat> inlining type inference is actually written in Julia, works with Julia expression objects and transforms them, figures out what the types of things are by doing a data flow type inference algorithm. Uh, and then we generate LLVM IR, and then LLVM does all of its stuff, you know, however many uh, optimization passes, and then native code gen to machine instructions. So this upper part is Julia, lower part is LLVM. It's a pretty straightforward breakdown. Um, so a simplified version of this, just, just to make it easier to di diagram where we're hooking into things. So JIT operates down here, right? It's, it's essentially being like, okay, whoa, 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 you know, right before you actually want to execute something, let me generate it at that point. Users don't really have to mess around with that. Um, macros occur at the AST level, right? So, and everybody in here is going to be familiar with that, so I don't really have to explain much, although I will demo how we do macros in Julia shortly. We have this new thing, relatively new in version, in the previous stable version, um, called a generated function. Uh, and this is a name we kind of made up. If anybody has a better name for it, um, <clears throat> I'm all ears. So a generated function is similar to a macro in that user code runs and generates an AST, but it happens after type inference has already occurred. Um, and at that point, you actually know a lot about what is going on, which is kind of nice. You also don't have access to syntax anymore, though. Um, and you can cache it at that point 
um, based on the type AST, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, all right, so this is my next demo. Okay, um, so first I'm gonna do, you know, a little, a straightforward macro. Um, <clears throat> let's see, so, you know, time it, expression, so you declare it with, with a macro keyword, um, and essentially all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a quoted block and I'm gonna say, uh, T0 equals time, uh, and then I'm going to splice in that expression, uh, and I'm going to uh, say T1 equals time, and then I'm going to do print line uh, time T1, T1 minus T0. And then I'm going to return Okay, and then the whole thing is going to evaluate, evaluate to that. I'll get to that. Yeah. Um, okay, so, you know, one plus two. All right, yeah, uh, it takes almost no time. Um, if we do sleep one, okay, returns nothing, and the time, time it takes is about a little over one second. I think the first time there's a little compilation lag. Um, okay. All right, straightforward. Um, can we see, the, well, so what Didier was getting at is that there's no, no hygiene done here. We don't do automatic hygiene. We have a very simple kind of rudimentary system for hygiene, but it gets the job done and it's relatively unconfusing. And what that is is you so we, we can actually, I, I, could, I could try to confuse this, but rather than try to confuse the, the macro, you guys understand why hygiene is important. Um, I'll show you what you have to do. And is you have this special function called escape, which basically just inserts a, an AST node that says this, is, this thing is supposed to be in the caller's uh, context not in the macros context. And everything else is assumed to be in the macros context. And you just have to manually apply that to any expression or variable that you want to be in the caller's context. Um, and then everything else is appropriately renamed so that it doesn't clash with the calling context and so that any global that's referred to is coming from the, from the, the macro definer's context. And that's it. I mean, that's basically the whole thing. Um, and if you do that, then your, your macros will work appropriately across modules. Um, someone observed recently that doesn't, this doesn't protect you from intra-module hygiene issues, which is actually totally true, but it just hasn't been a big issue. Um, we also don't allow you to define lo ma macros in local scopes. Um, fundamentally, this comes down to the fact that like, you just don't use macros as much in Julia as you do in Lisp. Um, so we don't, we don't push it as hard. Um, so. Theoretically, these are problems, but in practice, we haven't really hit a wall with it. Um, but, you know, you gotta have something to fix in the future. Um, okay, so that's, that's a basic macro. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I, it's kind of fun to see what, what numerical people come up with to do with macros. I mean, I'm sure people have done this sort of thing with, with Lisp. Um, Okay, so there's this corner macro and the eval poly macro. Okay, so Horner's rule is basically, uh, it's just a way of efficiently, efficiently evaluating a, a polynomial um, by, by sort of factoring it out this way. You can see the, the, the code here. Um, instead of raising x to various powers, you, multi you multiply the inner thing and then you multiply each st at each stage by x and you get more powers of x. Um, and so we can see this in action by doing something like, uh, oops, macro expand, uh, oops. Um, and this is gonna expand, 
do do Horner's rule. Oh, okay, I understand why this is not showing. It's because my, I'm going off the screen. And you can see it just calls the multiply add function um, over and over again. And you can see that, the, you know, it's just nested multiply add. It's very straightforward, not that hard. Um, but there's an interesting rule that's in, there's a, there's a clever thing that's in Knuth called, that, that lets you do something, save several operations, um, and get better order of magnitude for lots and lots of operations um, if you use complex numbers. And so we have this as an eval poly macro. So instead of specifically doing Horner's rule, if you do eval poly, you'll see that you get this totally crazy thing, which is much more complicated looking. Um, this actually boils down to less instructions in the complex case. And what you'll also see is that for the code that's emitted, uh, there's an if that says if uh, the ar argument is uh, complex, then do this, else do this. So this is just the normal Hor Horner's rule stuff, and that's the, the special thing from Knuth. Um, the compiler is smart enough to, f to figure out if it can infer that this is, is or is not complex, it just gets rid of one of the branches. So you don't actually pay for that cost at runtime. Um, and we can see that the, uh, okay, that the LVM, actually that LVM code looks horrible. Uh, let's define a function that does this. Oh, that's because X is a global. Um, f of x equals that. Um, okay. Okay. So you can see that for uh, for a real number, it's actually it does that efficient thing. Um, for a complex number, you do this longer thing, but this is still more efficient than doing Horner's rule. Okay, so this is kind of clever stuff that numerical people come up with. Um, so now let me get to the last thing I'm going to talk about, generated functions. Um, so a generated function, okay. So I'm going to do a generated function which iterates through an array with n nested for loops. And what it does is it takes, you know, n is one of the type parameters. So you have this n loops function. It takes an array. But when, but when you have this at generated macro in front to annotate it, basically what that says is take this method body and bind the type of A to the name A and then evaluate this body and then the, the AST that is returned is what I want you to actually execute. Um, and so what we do here is we, okay, we make a list of variable names, which is just a symbol array, uh, and then we have an inner expression and an outer expression, which it starts out being the same as the inner. Then for all of the n dimensions, we're going to add another for loop to the inner body. Um, and so we define a variable, it's called, gonna be called i and then the number of the dimension. Um, and then we push that name onto the list of variables and then we push, um, we push some code onto, onto the inner stuff and then on the outer stuff we basically take the previous outer, splice it into the middle of the outer and wrap another for loop around it. Uh, then we do another th another stuff with the inner stuff, and, and, and then we return the outer whole outer expression at the end. Okay, that seems a little crazy, but let's you know call it n loops. Uh, so ran three, so it's this random array of three values, and you can see that it prints them out. Um, okay, prints all of those. All right, prints a lot of stuff. But what is it doing? Um, and so what we can do is delete the generated function part, uh, call, gen n, call this gen n loops, and then instead of that, we do this. We call type of, mm -hmm. did I screw this up somehow? Gen n loops, oh yeah, yeah, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Um, we, need, we need it to be the type, it needs to dispatch on the type of that thing. There we go, okay. So what you can see here is that for one dimension, it generates that for loop. Uh, for two dimensions, it generates two nested for loops. For another, you know, we stick another one in there, we get three, if we get, you know, yeah. 
Okay. So this allows you to admit write very generic, uh, very efficient numerical code. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to make the, the topic of discussion be how lispy is Julia. Uh, I think you were you were first. Uh, yeah, yeah, it can be. Um, so, it, on the whole, with the, the, I mean, so we're in the right time for this, right? Like these techniques were invented in the like 60s and 70s to make dynamic languages go fast. Um, at the time, like people were not ready for this amount of code generation or any any of this stuff. Now, in the numerical computing niche, with the amount of data and the amount of code that people are generating in C++ anyway. Uh, we're kind of in the, it's the right time and place. Um, but we do have to have heuristics to figure out when to stop generating code. Um, they're imperfect, but you know, they're usually pretty good. But you know, the way you figure that out is you have a large number of benchmarks and well, when one of them tanks, you figure out why and you try to go figure out if you can tweak the heuristics to make it better. But you know, they're heuristics, they're never perfect. Um, and we do allow people to do stuff like you know, annotating stuff to say, don't specialize on this. Um, so, you know, we're not above sticking, you know, macros that tell, that stick something into the AST, which the compiler's like, oh yeah, yeah, don't, don't do this. Just, you know, you gotta get work done. So, but yes, we do generate a, an awful lot of code. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. array of mm -hmm. string, and how do you handle, and do you handle functional types, and, and how do you handle the covariance, covariance Ah, that's an excellent question. Um, so our parametric types are invariant, uh, because that is really the only correct thing to do if you're not going to separate the input type from the output type, which is sort of the correct way to do it. I think Idris does that, um, Edwin Brady, pointed out that you could do this correctly that way to me, and I was like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, but we, that seems too complicated for us. Um, so so the, the interesting thing is we, we can actually compensate for it with dispatch. So what we do is for covariance, you, you'll do things like, let me, uh, you'll do something like define a method f, um, and you'll say t is any kind of abstract uh, array, and then you'll say a is of type t. And that effectively makes that covariant. So I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, or, or actually, well, let's say, let's say something like this. This is actually not a good example. Uh, so abstract string, and then array of t. That's a better example, because it actually has a parametric type, otherwise it makes no sense. Um, so the point here, so what people will do is they'll say, you know, they will say, they will reach for this. They'll say, okay, I want array of abstract string to do something. Um, and then they will make an array of foo and bar, uh, which is actually an array of type string, which is a concrete type that is a subtype of abstract string. And they'll call it on this and they'll be like, ah, oh, why did I get one and not two? Um, and so this is a point of confusion, um, but we feel like the trade-off is okay. But the dispatch allows you to effectively write uh, covariant types by, by doing that. Yes, yes, all parametric types, the subtyping is baked into the language and is invariant. Um, 
we would like, to, it probably would make sense to have a syntax for something like this um, that's common enough so you could just, this is a more lightweight syntax and it would just be like anything that's a subtype of abstract string, um, but we haven't implemented that yet. Um, It comes up now and then. People are, this is one of those like FAQ things where you're like, yeah, yeah you're hitting the type invariance thing. Um, and then people learn it and they, they deal with it. Um, it uh, I think on the whole, it's, it's simpler this way. Um, but but it's, there's definitely, I have definitely thought at times about like, ah, wouldn't it be better if things were covariant? But then wait, we need a way of talking about the, the actual type where the element, the concrete element type is abstract array. Because uh, that is an actual thing that we can have. Um, so, so, you know, it, it complicates things in a different way then. Um, contravariance cannot be represented this way. We don't have a way of saying this thing is a super type of that when we're doing type parameters. Um, the way we typically handle that is very dynamic languagey, which is this uh, do automatic conversion to the type that you expect to put into the thing. And then if the conversion fails, you get an error. Um, so that, that's how we handle that side of things. Yes? Yes. Pretty much. Um, so it is, it's really the observation, and then this is not, you know, this is not a thing you necessarily know beforehand, but it turns out that with a combination of better, Better data because when we def we declare types and you know what the field types are because you can specify them. Um, multiple dispatch gives you nice information because you kind of you intersect what you know about the types in your local scope with the methods that are called on it, um, and that type intersection is more constrained than either of the methods available or the type things you know about the types, and you can actually get better type information once you apply a method because you know it's otherwise it's an error. Um, and then, and then doing aggressive specialization on actual runtime types, uh, that that combination gives you a huge amount of type information. Um, the trade-off is a huge amount of code gen. Um, but, but, but the people who are using this are very happy to pay that price. Um, and, and they were doing it anyway, right? The, the people who are, who need this kind of performance were using C++ and templates which, you know, you're just doing that code gen, but you're doing it all the time for anything you might possibly use instead of the things you actually have to use. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's how we do it. Um, cool. All right, thank you. Oh, oh do we, well, one last question. You can ask me lots of questions after this. So, yes. Uh, yeah, um, in uh, common list, when you write macros, mm -hmm. Uh, there cannot be the, um, the the compiler renames things for you when you, it basically just, you know, yeah, and you can see that in, uh, I think in the generated code here, um, maybe not in this version, but if you, here, let, let's see, if you do, so n loops, uh, ran two, three, all right, so there's the code, if you look at the code, Lowered, which is going to be totally nasty, but you'll see that the uh, the names are renamed and it's it does it's SSA style, so it's just actually slots. There's not even names anymore at that point. Um, and you know, there's like things names that you can't actually use, like hash temp hash. You know, um, the names are really just kept around at this point to tell you what you called it. So it's not it's not actually relevant to the compiler anymore. Um, so yeah, that's automatically handled for you. Um, you can intentionally break hygiene if you want to. So for example, if you have a variable name and you call escape on it, and it is it clashes with something in the calling context, you can you can do that. Um, sometimes it's useful. Usually, you don't want to do that though. Um, great. Thank you. <laughs>